things that have basically kicked off in um, um, nine years ago, um, um, right after the earthquake here in Tohoku. Okay. Um, which, uh, which happened two and a half weeks after a massive quake hit Christchurch in uh -huh. my own country, um, New Zealand. Yeah. And yeah, um, those two quakes, um, uh, prior to those two quakes, I had no interest and no experience in growing any food at all. Um, my mum used to do it, or I used to just buy it from the supermarket. But then, yeah, those two quakes, I um, saw, like you most likely did, the devastation up in Tohoku. And I just thought, right, um, life could change for us anywhere here in Japan um, at any moment. And I thought, right, if, um, if a massive earthquake hits Tokyo, for example, um, which it could today, even um, today. buildings collapsed, uh, supermarkets got destroyed, and uh, particularly roads that um, trucks carrying um, um, food down uh, get blocked, uh, I just thought, right, where would food come from? And yeah. I just had no answer. I just like had no answer, and thought, right, uh, grow food at home, so it doesn't have, to, so we're not dependent on food being trucked in from the countryside. Yeah. Um, here in Japan, I think um, historically, um, farmers used to be um, um, have like a high status in society, and because they grew food. Um, but in most countries now, they're one of the lowest. Yeah. Um, and uh, food self-sufficiency rate, uh, last time I checked, was about 26%. No. Which rate higher than that? Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. 26%, which means that, um, that the rest, uh, that's, that's about 74% of the nutrient needs for the people living here in Japan is, is imported. I'm sorry, here in Japan, not even 2% of the population is involved in food production. And considering there's 125 odd million, yeah, considering there's um, like 125 odd million people living here, oh, that's not so surprising because um, farming can be mechanized these days, but it's not typically here. There's still sort of many small scale farmers. I've had a chance to interview a beekeeper and a few farmers, yeah. and I was really surprised that the beekeeper was saying, he can't set up his hives near rice farms because there's yep. too much pesticides. And so yep. he had yep. Yep. an organic farm next to him or a natural farm where they don't spray pesticides so that his bees were healthier and, and they were happy because all the yep. vegetables were being pollinated by his bees. Yep. Um, there's one particular pesticide uh, which is commonly sprayed on crops um, that's been known to kill bees. And you might, this might be a bit surprising, but um, actually um, one of the, um, the safest places to breed um, bees is in the cities. Right. And can you guess why? Because there's no rice farming? There's no spray in cities. Right, because, yeah. Because um, there's, no um, there's no large scale crops in, ci yeah. in cities, so there's no need to spray pesticides. That makes and sense. Because, and, and because of, of that one simple reason, um, um, cities could well be safer for bees <laughs> yeah well that's that's perfectly exactly what you're trying to do right you're trying to get rooftop farming and urban farming started in japan yeah um quite definitely it's been my goal um since i kicked off uh, since i basically kicked things off nine years ago um yeah quite simply that um uh, it all comes back to the earthquake um um self-sufficiency um if we don't have to rely on food being trucked in from the countryside or um, needing to go down to the supermarket and purchase food from there, we can become more self-sufficient. And, uh, and the simple answer is just grow food where you live. Yeah. And when I thought about that, when I kicked things off, I just thought, hey, this is what people have been doing for centuries. Um, since agriculture was invented, I, I don't know how many thousands of years ago that was, at a garden or in town somewhere, it was basically growing food close to where you live. Yeah, that but, makes so much sense. Yeah. And if it and it it tastes better, it's healthier, and you have food security, right? Food security—that's a big one. Yeah, yeah, yep. Can you recommend uh, certain vegetables or fruits that is good to grow on roofs that not too difficult if somebody's trying to get started? Yep, um, lettuces should be your go-to one. Um, they can be grown right through, the, uh, right through the year from basically March until November. Yeah, um, you've got about a nine month window for them. Wow, good. Um, like radishes, um, yep, spinach is a good one. 
uh, Swiss chard. That's like a zombie. They, they're really difficult to kill. <laughs> uh, uh, kale, that's pretty hardy as well. Uh, dealing with heat is a major issue for rooftop farming. Um, there's two workarounds for hot, um, um, for growing food on hot rooftops. Number one is uh, don't grow during the summertime in Japan, which is uh, <laughs> July, August. Yeah. Uh, just keep away from summer. Just take and, a break. Um, yeah, just take a break. Yeah, it's just so hot, eh? Uh, especially here in Tokyo. Uh, but the uh, the main workaround is you can purchase what's called um, shade sheets. It's getting hotter. Should you water twice a day, like in the morning and evening? Avoid the middle of the day watering, is that right? Um, during summertime, that's exactly what you should do. Yep, during summertime. So um, you're collecting rainwater, that's a key thing as well. I mean, that uh, um, if you can collect rainwater from your roof and use it to water your garden, bring it on. Great idea. Yeah. <laughs> By catching your own uh, rainwater, you're actually um, cutting down the amount of water that runs into the city um, uh, drainage system, which helps to reduce the demand on it and reduce yeah. load. Yeah. Because um, if you have a garden, in the ground, um, the water goes into the ground. It doesn't flood, or well, hopefully won't flood. Um, the water will go down because there's somewhere to go down. Yeah. Whereas if it uh, falls on concrete, it will go down to the lowest point, and that's usually down a road or down a hill. Yeah. And if growing fruit in the ground, that's the best place. Um, that's where plants um, are mostly happier there. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, as long as there's um, sufficient uh, sunlight. Yep. Um, yeah, raised gardens are basically the next best thing to gardens in the ground. And the key is to basically um, that raised gardens, providing they're deep enough and wide enough, they can basically trick your plants to think that the plants are actually growing in the ground. Okay. And if plants think that they're growing in the ground or actually are growing in the ground, then they will, will grow to their maximum size and potential. Um, by providing this sufficient direct s sunshine. Yeah, because um, um, the thing is, um, there's, um, there's a rule that I call the bonsai rule. Um, you know bonsai trees? They yes. grow, um, they're always really small because they're, um, they're grown in tiny containers. Okay. They're either grown in a small pot or even a tray sometimes. And bonsai trees, yeah, uh, because um, there's not much room for their roots to grow, they don't grow very big. But I think that if you planted a uh, bonsai tree in the ground, it would grow just like a normal tree. Is that right? Because so, there's, so you might be see bonsai trees in the forest growing huge, but you don't know because they weren't contained. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That and is the crazy. Same, um, the same rule applies to plants. Um, if you plant, for example, a strawberry plant or a tomato plant in a small pot, it won't grow very big, and it won't grow very big because um, the roots are, are in a constricted um, area but if you plant your plant in a much larger pot or in the ground it'll grow to its full size and I found this out myself because I planted a tomato plant in a tiny pot where it would have been about I don't know uh, 15 centimeters high and it grew about 20 about 20 about 20 tomatoes um, but then I grew the same size uh, seedling in my community garden in the ground and it, it grew two meters high and produced 200 tomatoes Wow. So um, the more space, the bigger your plant's going to get. And if you use small pots, it won't grow very big. So when it comes to gardening, aim big. Um, okay. If, you're contain if you are using containers and planter boxes, um, get the biggest ones you can. But I basically learned um, most of, of what I know now just by doing it in myself. Getting a pot and buying some soil and dropping some seeds in it and seeing what happened. And then, yeah, it's all, it's basically largely trial and um, error and the more and the longer that you grow food for the more you learn it's basically you um, learn from experience like with most things right um and i've been doing this now for nine years so i know a lot about how large plants grow and uh -huh. when's the best time to grow them and where's the best place to grow them certain plants can deliver certain nutrients to the soil um one good resource to look up about this is is the uh is a um a growing method from South America called the uh, Three Sisters. Three Sisters are basically three different vegetables that are, are typically grown together in South America and they all complement each other. For example, one of them is a climber that climbs up, up the corn. And another one pumps a, a lot of nitrogen into the soil naturally, which is, is um, good for the other two plants. So these three uh, sister plants, when grown together, they work in perfect um, harmony. 
to promote growth of all three. I think um, you seem very focused on sustainability and and the news and stuff. Um, have you ever tried like reusing containers or using biodegradable materials in your gardening on rooftops? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, two liter plastic bottles um, can easily be um, recycled into planting containers. You just cut them in half and plant something in them. Yep, so uh, recycling goes hand in hand with gardening. It's a really, uh, these are two really good um, areas to combine, uh, especially when you're um, working with or, or teaching kids. Um, um, the plastic bottle that they drink from can become home to seeds or a plant um, really easily, and they can do it all. They can basically create their own uh, recycled uh, planting containers from plastic bottles. How about milk cartons? Do you use milk, milk cartons? Cart um, yeah, milk cartons can be used. Uh, milk cartons, um, I was teaching kids last year how to make mini greenhouses from milk cartons. Oh, um, nice. Mini cardboard cartons. You can even make your own compost in a milk carton. Uh, my daughter learned how to do that at the, uh, at the Japanese school that she goes to. You just basically put um, compostable, compostable materials into a milk carton and wait, and it'll break down and form compost which is perfect recycling because it means you don't have to, um, to throw your kitchen waste away. It becomes plant food. Yeah. Well, it seems that what you're doing is basically uh, um, uh, soil management, which is basically where you slowly uh, build up your soil over the years uh, by putting compost into it um, just to improve the quality and improve the nutrient content. And I've got another friend here who's doing the same outside Tokyo. Um, and she says she's got wonderful soil. Because if you put a slice of tomato on top of uh, soil in a large planter box, it'll probably grow. Really? There's lots of seeds in tomatoes, yeah. Just, um, up here in Tokyo, who um, he uh, basically, um, um, he's got some, um, some large planter uh, buckets at the front. Uh, filled them with soil. And um, then he basically placed slices of tomato on top of the soil basically one slice in each container and they grow there's up to like there's uh, there's 25 plus different vegetables that can be grown from um um from themselves uh, like a, um for example you know um um celery you eat the leaves right but you uh, don't eat the very bottom where the leaves come from uh, are coming from if you basically um, cut off the root on the bottom of a celery plant and turn it over and put it on top of your soil uh, and water it, it'll grow roots. Uh, same awesome. thing with, uh, with tomatoes uh, um, and same thing um, with potatoes too. Um, like one common way to grow, uh, to grow potato, to regrow potatoes is you just get a tomato that's sprouting. So it's like quite old, it's like um, growing sprouts. Yeah. And you just cut and you just cut it into slices, and you put the slices onto your soil, and then water them, and they'll start to grow roots. That's and the magic. Same thing with carrots and lettuces and komatsuna and nazuna. Uh, you can basically regrow plants again from old plants. In Hawaii, mm -hmm. and uh, they showed us the taro plant, the taro mm -hmm. potato. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Called yeah, taro, it yeah, yeah taro imo. Yeah, ta and yeah. uh, he he was showing me how after you cut off the top and you take the potato to eat you just put the top back in the ground and then yeah, it grows yeah. again and i thought oh my yeah. gosh that's so brilliant and so yeah. simple and amazing but you're you're saying yeah. most plants can do that which again if you're uh, teaching or working with kids that's a really cool way to get them um to get excited about growing food you just basically put food on the table for them no kidding uh, uh, then um, show them how the food scraps from their plate can be used to regrow um, their food again. I think if you just put them straight in, because the thing is, um, um, nature is really good at, at regenerating itself. And it regenerates naturally by old plants and fruit uh, dropping to the ground and then regrowing. That, that was my biggest takeaway from reading Fukuoka Sensei's book about um, just letting nature do its thing. Like yeah, he, yeah. he worked for, I think, a chemical or biological company in Japan. And he was yeah. so disillusioned by how 
man made man people are trying to improve on nature. Yeah. And then he gave it all up and went to a farm and decided that no, nature is smart. We have to That's learn from nature and let it do its thing. Totally true. Yeah, totally true. And if you want to find out how to grow food naturally, talk to the older generation now, um, the grandparents' generation now. They're the ones who grew up with organic food when it wasn't called organic food. It was just called food. And, and prior to about the mid-1950s, um, all food was organic. But when um, artificial um, fertilizer began to be um, used widespread, um, um, that's when uh, cancer rates in many countries spiked uh, from about the mid-1950s. Um, because that's when, uh, when um, food supplies and crop production in many countries began to be poisoned by these um, factory-produced fertilizers. And that's when what could be, uh, what could be described as uh, the mass poisoning of our food supply began. Um, and it's, and it's, I don't want to seem too cynical, but the reason that has perpetuated is because there's a lot of money in it, right? That there's, there's money a, to be made a, by... There's a ton of money people. in it, yeah, yeah. Yep, there's a ton of money. And um, um, uh, many farmers know about Monsanto, mm. um, the seed company. Yeah, um, oh. yeah, um, they're here as well. And um, just a quick one about them. So horrible. Um, you, um, you probably know about Monsanto. They have a, um, a, um, a seed and spray package uh, that they sell to farmers. They have um, their Roundup um, uh, um, uh, pesticide spray that they sell as part of a package with their GMO seeds. So um, farmers who want to purchase uh, GMO seeds from uh, Monsanto, they have to buy the sprays too, uh, the Roundup. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally on board with, is it Dr. Bronner? The guy yeah. who made that, that uh, cleaner chain, right? And his idea was, if you can't eat it yourself, don't use it. Like, yeah. it should be so natural that you can eat it. You can use it for everything. Yeah. When I did my master's in sustainable tourism, studying about dirt and how important dirt is and how the dirt we have now is the same dirt and water from when the dinosaurs were here. It's, it doesn't yeah. go anywhere. It yeah, has yeah, yeah. to be the same dirt over and over again that we're reusing. So what the heck are we doing? Putting chemicals into it. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, every season when they spray it, either using crop dust, um, uh, crop duster planes or um, uh, heavy machinery that basically cruises along their farms spraying um, their poisons. The so they look here. good, but you can't see the poisons inside. No. And it, um, um, the bottom line is, is that uh, people who purchase commercially produced food that's been sprayed and take it home, um, no matter what they say about how much um, they love their kids, um, they're poisoning their kids. And that's a really key point to understand because then it, um, it really highlights what, what we need to do, which is cut down or ideally cut out the poisons. And the best way to do that is to grow your own food without poison. Um, without poisons, um, Definitely. With no chemicals. So, I'm so happy that you're you're spending so much of your time teaching kids, because the education of urban gardening is so important for future generations. It is, yeah. Well, uh, what I'm sort of trying to do is to basically um, to bend the curve backward to the past, because um, I've been surprised. There's so many kids that I've been teaching uh, um, um, have allergies, and the kids know. It. Um, the teachers know about it because the parents give the teachers a list of what particular uh, foods that they ca um, that their kids can't eat. And when I was going to um, and when I was going to school last century, oh, that sounds a long time ago. Um, um, uh, um, no one that I heard of in my entire school uh, had allergies. Uh, maybe some of them did, but it wasn't a common thing like it is now. Um, but the way to, to basically control, to have much greater control over your, the health of yourself and your family is to grow your own food and don't use chemicals because then you know exactly what's in your food and more importantly, probably what's not in your food, which is yeah. hopefully going to be chemicals. For sure. So by, so by growing your own um, urban food, you can actually take back control of 
not just what you eat, but if you have a family, what your family is. Again and again and again. And the answers are in the past. And there are only two generations in the past. The thing is, um, uh, bottom line for all of this um, sustainability stuff is to basically um, to move forward as a species in a more sustainable and healthy way. All we need to do is look back about two or three generations into the past and find out what our grandparents and our great grandparents did to grow food and yeah. live and just bring those practices back into the present and do them. Yeah. Absolutely. Because they, yeah, um, they did it. Um, and one thing, uh, just one thing is uh, plastic water bottles. Um, in 2012, I think it was 2012, there was something like 12 billion plastic water bottles were produced. That's, um, that's just plastic water bottles. Uh, um, that's not um, soft drink bottles or tea bottles or uh, bottles used for other liquids. Um, yeah, well, if you go back um, 70 years, even uh, 60 years, um, there were no plastic bottles, which means that there's no, um, no pollution caused by plastic bottles because there weren't any. And let's no go, one died. Let's go back to that. Yeah, uh, no one died because there <laughs> were no plastic bottles. Let's back get the, the drink machines that have reusable bottles back, you know, the glass bottles. Yeah. That you yeah, drink it and yeah, you leave yeah, it there and it's yeah. washed and reused. Let's bring that yeah. back, you know. Um, can I can I bring you back a little bit to yeah. the the education, the gardening yeah, sure, education? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, just do you have any advice while people are in quarantine for getting their kids excited about doing a bit of gardening on the roof or on their terrace or wherever they have space? Yep. Um, just get them, um, just buy a pot and some soil and some seeds and get them to put the seeds into the soil and see what grows. Um, that's exactly what I'm doing with my five-year-old boy right now. He uh, sowed some seeds about four days ago and they probably sprouted this morning, but he doesn't know it yet because we haven't been outside yet. Wow, exciting. Yeah, so, yeah um, just get kids just to grow, um, just to um, uh, sow some seeds. And it's magic. It's much better than going to Disneyland to see magic. This is a real, this is a real natural magic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just get them to grow some seeds and get them to water the, um, the seeds um, daily, and see what comes up. Um, and my main resources is my um, urban farming guide um, called um, "How to Grow Healthy Food in the City." It's a 60-page um, a guide that I wrote myself based on um, uh, seven years of successful. Um, uh, food growing um, they can just get in touch with me yeah 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 and um, this book's basically it's my uh, Japan based experience of how to grow food successfully and once people learn how to grow food they can hopefully become teachers themselves and that's what I want to do with the kids basically tr um, what I call uh, train the trainers so when I teach kids uh, uh, most of them know nothing about how to grow food and I want them to get to the point where they are comfortable and knowledgeable and experienced enough that they can go home and teach their families, teach their younger brothers and sisters and mums and dads um, how to grow food themselves. And once that takes off, and it is, um, then people can spread what I teach and my uh, um, impact of what I do can spread naturally. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. And how have you found doing <laughs> online seminars in, in quarantine now or stay oh, yeah. in the zone are you yeah. doing okay my first one last weekend with an american couple um up here in tokyo it was just like a test run and it worked so i'm, re I'm really happy now that i can basically set up them um and i'm going to start from i started promoting them yesterday um because i've normally uh been doing um home uh, um home visits where i basically go to people's houses and take a really heavy bag full of soil and pots and garden gear and show them at their kitchen table how to grow food and go and um, basically run them through all the basics of um, urban farming and then demonstrate how to or get them to um, get their hands dirty, um, learning how to sow seeds and transplant uh, seedlings. But now I can do it without leaving home, which means- That is awesome. All, um, remotely, which means I can do it. I can teach people all over Japan and in other countries too. So I'm really ex excited about this. Really, That's really yeah. great. I'm basically offering um, whatever people want to learn. Um, I've got a whole, I've got a, a 
uh, like about 20 plus different uh, different lessons that I can teach, including hydroponics, um, how to build raised gardens, um, uh, balcony gardens, vertical farming, how to make compost, how to collect rainwater from your rooftop, um, how to sow seeds, transplant seedlings. I've got about, yeah, like I said, about 20 different uh, lessons that people can uh, basically pick and choose. Um, and it's all available now. Um, and people can, can learn from home and hopefully start. Because the thing is, it's reason yeah. you come to realize that there's two key parts to actually making an impact when it comes to, to growing food and urban farming. And the first thing is to teach. And the second thing is to motivate people. Because people can know how to grow food, but if they're not motivated to actually go and purchase the materials, the pots and the soil and the seeds, then it doesn't matter what they know. Um, the only way to actually create an impact when it comes to um, um, growing your own food is for people to grow their own food, not just to have the skills and the knowledge. They've actually got to, um, they've got to um, um, do it. Uh, that's the key thing. Well, absolutely. Um, I mean, we, we need motivational coaches, right? <clears throat> People have sports <throat> coaches. They have life coaches. They have counselors. Of course, they need gardening coaches or what do you call yourself? A green, green <laughs> coach? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. So, um, so motivation is a key thing. Um, and that's what I'm sort of really trying to push um, with my uh, teaching of, of the skills too. Because skills without motivation is... Is just skills. Good. Well, thanks so much yeah. for talking mm. to me today, John. It was awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll connect again soon, yeah? Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Yep. All right. Have a good day. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. I got it. Yeah.